And here we are for our final module, final part, module six, security and safety. This is part 2B. Now in part 2B, or not 2B, <laughs> we're gonna cover use strong authentication, explain the benefits of encryption, and measures to prevent identity theft and protect your personal financial information. Keep in mind as we talk about this from a personal focus, we use these same strategies and these same techniques to secure the data for the businesses we run. Because folks, if a business is to lose their primary data, you may in fact lose your job. So it is your responsibility to secure the information that you interact with. When you find things that are questionable, bring them up to the IT prof professionals, bring them up to the security folks within your organization. So it all starts with a strong password. You know, a strong password is a longer combination of letters, numbers, symbols. Now, one thing not noted here is the idea of a pass phrase where we might use something like farms for farmers where I change the F to a PH. That's called salting my password. P-H-A-R-M-E-R-S. P-H-O-R. P-H-A-R-M-E-R-S. Okay, so if I do some salting, it helps the password. So nice thing with passphrases today is you combine words that, first of all, combine them all together, make one single password. Don't use associated words, you know, like a breed of a dog and then dog, okay? Use, use three unique words that you can remember and then constantly change your passwords. Now, I'm gonna be anal about passwords. My belief today is to use a password manager and I'm gonna spend some time explaining why. So yes, you can create longer passwords. The fact is you cannot remember 25 passwords for 25 unique sites unless you make them similar or make them the same. Another way, by the way, to salt a password, if you absolutely insist on not taking my advice and you use a common password, is to salt it with things that remind you of the company. Okay, so let me just use Bank of America. What I could do is use the B and the A and put that in front and in back or in front and in middle or in the middle BA in a password that I use all the time, thus creating a unique password. Now I bring this up in the upper right. Notice one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine was used by 7.7 .7 million users while QWERTY and password were each used by more than 3 million accounts. Okay, so that's a study that was done. Pop that off the web. Notice top 10 passwords. This was 2018 where QWERTY, password, there you are. If you're using these passwords, you are just begging, begging to be hacked. Because the fact is, if you're using this for your Facebook and I know your email and I log into your Facebook and I try these, these are the ones I'm gonna try first. I'm gonna try the top 50 passwords. Then I'm gonna run a dictionary attack where I use a, use a dictionary to go through words. It's an automated process. I don't have to do it manually. I just get this program to go out and attack and try and try and try again till it gets the password, okay? So I'm gonna tell you how to protect yourself. Do not repeat characters in sequence. A, B, C, one, two, three, QWERTY, okay? Do not use birthdays, family members' names, pet names. Yes, these are easy to remember, but this also means if I do a little social engineering, if I know you, a lot of people's accounts that are hacked are hacked by people they know. So keep that in mind. You also can salt your passwords. I gave you a couple examples, but here's another one. Instead of using password, <laughs> don't use password. It's just an example, folks. Please, I implore you, do not use password as your password. Do not use capital P at dollar sign, dollar sign, W0RD. The fact is Microsoft uses that for all of their training stuff because it's easy to remember, okay? So don't use it. Um, what we can do is P1 at 2, S3, S4. You notice what I'm doing is I'm salting the word with another sequence of letters, numbers, or special characters. But folks, it doesn't go anymore. I can't stress anymore that today, if you wanna protect yourself, don't have 
two passwords that are the same. And the way you do that is to use a password manager. What you are going to need to do is secure the one master password because if you lose that, these password companies cannot get back your data. They encrypt it so hard that not even their employees can see your passwords. And they do that to protect themselves and to protect you. So what I would suggest is create a huge long. If, if your last pass will allow a 32 character, uppercase, lowercase, special character, etc., make something up. Look at the keyboard and go, I'll use this, I'll use this, I'll use this. Because the fact is, you're not going to have to put it in very often. With LastPass, I use actually one pass for some work stuff and LastPass for my personal stuff. So they're both on my phone. Because I can use biometrics when I want to use a password that's stored in LastPass for a website, I use my finger and I'm good with that. So I never have to put in that master password. What I do with that is I write it on a sticky, I take it to my social security box, and it's in there. If something happens to me, people know that they can get to my last pass by getting in my social security box and getting that password. <laughs> the cool thing is, companies are now, because they know that you wanna use password managers, they're now creating code that will interact with the password manager to say, we accept a password that's up to 24 characters. We don't accept special characters, but we accept uppercase and lowercase and numbers. And it'll automatically generate and store that. You paste it in and it will even remind you to change them. It will even remind you, by the way, to do a security check on your own passwords to see how many passwords you're using are the same and suggest other passwords. There's also the fact, by the way, that Google has the ability for you to go out and look at passwords that you've stored in browsers. I don't store my passwords in browsers, folks. Okay, I'm lying. I store one password because I'm in that account all the time. I store it, but I'm willing to have that risk. Normally, I'm willing to put in my password the first time today in a multi-authentication site that I might use throughout the day. And again, my password manager can do it for me. Biometrics is a way to get into your computer, get into your phone. You know, retinal scans you see down at the lower right here. Fingerprint scans. Again, my LastPass uses my fingerprint scan, meaning LastPass is on my computer. I go to my Bank of America um, mobile app and it says, hey, we need your username and password. We see you don't store them. You don't save them. So what I have to do is use my fingerprint and it gets me in through my last pass okay we can use voice activation and then of course facial recognition so i have one computer that i'm currently testing microsoft's um hello i guess it's hello face or face hello on and it seems to work um i'm just not real i can be so far away from the computer i just not sure i trust it what I do with most of my stuff whenever possible is this and that. All right, so two-factor authentication, here we go. <laughs> um, this is the best way to protect yourself. Now, if you noticed a break in the video, it was because I was talking about two-factor authentication and I just realized that in the image I gave you, I left my, my Gmail account listed. So now you see that it is blocked out. And the reason it's blocked out is so I can use this example. When I log into my computer, I give it a username and password. And then, of course, it goes out and says, OK, on my smartphone, you've logged in. Was it you that logged in? And if you were, do this so we know it was you. This is an example of two-factor authentication for my Gmail account. I've logged out of my Gmail account. I'm logging back in. I give it my my username, I give it my password, that's the first step in the authentication. And here it then, you're seeing an image on my phone where it says, hey, are you trying to log in? And of course, I need to say okay by performing this action, which means if somebody doesn't have my phone, they're not gonna be able to log in. And by the way, if it is me, I do this. If it's not, I can say it's not me and go through a process to better secure my account from that happening again. Benefits of encryption. So when we talk about what does it mean, WPA encryption and HTTPS encryption, it means scrambling the information, utilizing 
um, an algorithm and then descrambling it either with the same algorithm or a different algorithm. So what it does is it turns plain text into what's called ciphertext, okay? <laughs> and this is what HTTPS does. So there's two examples here that I show you. One is a shared key where we use the same key to encrypt and decrypt the data. That means the device that's encrypting it has one key and a device that is decrypting it has the same key. Now today, pretty much the standard is a public key and a recipient's private key. So a public key is a key used for decryption and then a unique private uh, key is used for decryption. So here, let me give you an example. If I log into a financial site, it will encrypt that data using a unique key just for that session, which means if five minutes later I log out and then I log right back in, I'm getting a brand new key for that session. So the only time a supercomputer can try to hack that key is within the five minutes that I'm on there. Some of these keys are rather large. Today, banks use 2048-bit encryption. That's 2048 ones and zeros in a unique combination that must be guessed and entered only while I'm on that session. So that's a way of doing it. In order to do it, we need a digital certificate. It's a technology used to verify a user's identification and key that has been signed by the trusted third party. So if you're in a browser, you go up and you hit the lock in your browser, you'll see a digital certificate. You'll see that those expire on a regular basis and those create those unique keys that authenticate companies to use them. Now folks, when we talk about encryption, <laughs> we focus on encrypting data as it travels over the internet or as it travels over networks. But let me be clear that we can also encrypt what's called data at rest and data at rest is the data on your computer now as i said in a previous video and i've done this many many times i get a computer i pull out the hard drive i do what's called slaving or attaching it to another computer and i can literally read the data on that drive because the drive is not encrypted today with solid state technology i highly recommend that you um, accept the performance degradation, the performance decrease, if you will, in your computer performance, you're not actually going to see it when you encrypt your hard drive using solid state. If you can encrypt a hard drive that's using the old magnetic media SATA serial ATA, you are going to see a performance degradation. Okay, But if you're running SSD, go ahead and encrypt that drive. What it means is if somebody steals your computer, they're not going to be able to connect it to another computer and get the data back. If you work at a business and you're using mobile technology, your IT professional should be encrypting that data. There should be no reason not to encrypt that data today. Okay, um, This is why we hear of things like 250,000 VA members having their personal data hacked because somebody from the VA got into a taxi, left their laptop, and on there was unencrypted data. Okay. Now keep in mind there are federal state laws and laws um, for industries that require encryption. So when you hear about health HIPAA, the Health Information Pr uh, Protection Privacy Act or Privacy Protection Act, I can't remember which it is, which P goes in which place, there are requirements for them to encrypt data at rest. So keep that in mind, check your industry. Identity theft, you know, one of the best ways to prevent identity theft is just to monitor your credit, monitor the accounts that are being reported on your credit. Because if you see something weird, you can get on it quickly. Now, of course, we want to try to prevent this from happening from the get go. And the way we can do that is anything that pertains personally identifiable information, PII, should not just be thrown in the garbage. It should at least be shredded and if anything, go into a secure barrel that then is disposed of properly by a trusted organization. At my home, everything I have is scanned. I scan in all my old bills and I shred them. I don't want old bills. I don't want social security cards. My social security cards exist inside my safe deposit box. If I need them, I go get them. Okay, we have to protect ourselves. We are responsible for identity theft. Again, this goes back to somebody charging on your credit card. Recently, I had somebody very close to me that 
was a victim of identity theft. The only reason why um, the person did not, wasn't able to charge the MacBook Pro is that this person in my life had limited the amount of charge for a day. And when it went over that, he, he got a notification of it and he went, uh-oh, somebody just tried to charge something. I need to contact my credit card company. I need to have them block that account. I need to have them start me a new account. And I definitely need to change all of my passwords, not just the passwords associated with that account. Preventing identity theft, I would encourage you to pause this video and read this slide here. Again, you know, protect your social security. Don't leave W-2s out while you're doing your taxes. Okay, protect the information, scan it in. Um, when you get your taxes back, scan them in, shred the original information. Don't have that information sitting around your house. And definitely, any time a credit card application comes in the mail for me, because I have decent credit, I go ahead and shred it. And then I use Credit Karma, as you saw, to monitor my credit, monitor my accounts. If I see a new account pop up, it's something I didn't open, I can contact the company immediately and go ahead and block that. Okay, so important security things, you've seen this, you know, I'm a believer in not keeping history on my browser. Um, it's not because I'm doing anything wrong on the computer, it's that I'm actually doing things right. And by deleting my browser history, by deleting cookies and scripting, it does make it more inconvenient for me to surf the web because, you know, information is not safe for me, making it easy for me to get into my Amazon site. I'd rather it be difficult than easy when it comes to shopping, okay? Um, <laughs> what I would like to see, and maybe they haven't and I haven't looked at it, I'm gonna have to look, is does Am Amazon have two-factor authentication? Meaning, as I log in, it would be nice for something to pop up on my phone saying, hey, you just logged into your Amazon account. Sure you wanna do that? Because you know you keep your credit card information to make it easy for you to pop in, grab an item, and get it shipped. So that would be interesting for me to look at. Scripting, so sites allow you to run special script. You may choose to block that. Plugins, check your plugins on your browser. There is actually a plugin now that Google offers that will check if you're one of those people that stores passwords in your browser. It actually has a means of checking to see if that um, password if you've used it on other sites, of course, these are sites associated with Google and you basically are trusting Google to go out and check if any of your passwords have been hacked or any of the places that you've used those passwords have in fact been hacked or notified of hacking. So plugins, pop-ups, clear that browser, uh, browser data, <laughs> clear that browser data, folks, and validate those plugins. Make sure that they're valid plugins for valid companies that you're expecting to be installed on your computer. Now, finally, the last slide of this presentation. I appreciate all of you that watched the whole thing, and I'm sure that you've learned a lot about digital literacy. If you came in with your cup half empty, hopefully we've filled it up even more, but you've kept it available for even more information as you learn more about digital literacy and computer competency. So of course, it goes without saying, protect your online profiles, use a password manager even when logging into Facebook, don't use your Facebook account to easily log into other sites, create unique passwords for that. Because again, if you're doing that for all these sites and you're using the same password and I get it, as a hacker, I'm gonna go try it in all the other sites, okay? Be cautious about what information you post. Be cautious about who you're giving information to, what information you're giving, how you're giving it. Be cautious to check for phishing sites and spear phishing things. If it sounds too good to be true, it most likely is. Of course, pay close attention to your financial information. Check in with the IRS. Check in with Social Security. You know, See if there's any information on there. Check in with the three credit reporting agencies. Folks, if you're not aware, Every year, you can go out and ask for free reports from all three of the major credit unions without doing anything out, without paying anything. Um, it's very easy to do. I do it once a year. It's part of my first week in January process to go out, get that. Even if Credit Karma says that I'm in good shape, I go out and I get those, make sure there's no accounts that I'm not familiar with, 
and also most importantly, make sure that any accounts I'm no longer using, that I close them to limit my exposure. That's it for now. I hope you enjoyed this video series. Take care and be safe on the web.